So we're just going to talk about uh, TE in regards to heart transplantation. Uh, no disclosures. Uh, so we'll talk about the different types of heart transplants and why that's important. Uh, the, the pre and post assessments of uh, the transplant, um, how to evaluate RV failure. Uh, I know they just talked about that in a previous session, but we'll briefly touch on it. And then um, uh, how to look at all the uh, anastomotic gradients, um, depending on the type of uh, transplant. So here's the three um, most common types of heart transplants. So this is the uh, biatrial. So there's a native uh, right atrial cuff and uh, left atrial cuff, and then uh, all the anastomoses for the uh, aortic and pulmonary arteries, um, the bicaval, which is just the native left atrial cuff with the SVC IBC. And then there's the total heart where each pair of uh, pulmonary veins has their own cuff. So there's a lot more uh, anastomotic sites here. And then uh, the reason why it's important is because um, after the, the, the transplant's done, and uh, you can see on the posterior uh, aspect of the left atrium, there can be these hypoechoic areas. And if there's instances of hypotension, you might think that this could be inoculated effusion or blood clots compressing the LA, but actually it's completely normal. And then this is the fourth type. Um, I don't really have much experience but, with it, but it's uh, just for completeness sake. Um, this is called the heterotopic heart transplant. So this is uh, kind of piggybacking the donor heart onto the uh, recipient heart. Essentially, this was uh, invented for patients with systemic pulmonary hypertension prior to heart transplantation. Essentially, now uh, we either do heart-lung transplants or they go on uh, VA ECMO. Um, and then essentially, as, as the RV remodels of the donor heart to the new pulmonary pressures, uh, you can uh, explant the, the native heart and have the single donor heart with the um, acclimized RV. Uh, so for the pre-bypass assessment, um, I think it's still an important thing to do, even though the heart's coming out, uh, there's still some uh, baseline um, pieces of information that you should have in case there's any issues coming off bypass. Uh, one of the things is knowing that there's laminar flow where you'll be having um, future uh, anastomoses. Uh, if there's any intracardiac clots, so these patients all have heart failure, or almost all have heart failure, so they're at higher risk for intracardiac clots. And uh, if you do find a clot, it might change how the surgeon should manipulate the heart during explantation, uh, minimize stroke risk or uh, pulmonary embolus risk. And then Likewise, there's a lot of mechanical devices involved with these patients, uh, making sure that the balloon pump is still in the right place even after uh, uh, post-implantation, uh, making sure there's no uh, uh, di uh, aortic dissection flaps or if there's any cannulation issues with ECMO. And then if uh, they're on peripheral ECMO in the either before or after, um, knowing that if there's like a tortuous aorta or if there's many um, big aortic plaques, uh, you, you might even decide before coming off bypass that maybe they need to stay on central ECMO instead of trying for a uh, peripheral cannulation. And then uh, post bypass is probably the most time intensive part of uh, the TE assessment. So go without saying uh, comprehensive exam is important, but uh, the most important uh, complication that can happen after a heart transplant is definitely RV failure. So it, it, it accounts for 50% of early cardiac complications and 20% of all heart transplant mortality. So it's a huge thing that we should be able to catch early and uh, try to do everything to prevent. Um, and then we'll talk about the gradients and uh, why the SVC IVC is actually uh, probably a little bit of an exception to the, the gradient rule because you, you can't get a good uh, gradient across it. And then, um, Utilizing direct measurement is actually very helpful if there's any question of um, stenosis. So we'll talk about RV failure uh, briefly. So like I said, it's the most common complication. Uh, CVP is very helpful because um, like they mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, echocardiographic images might be difficult to interpret. So uh, CVP greater than 12 is a uh, very 
concerning issue coming off uh, a new transplant. And then we'll talk about uh, the RV contraction, why it's different than LV contraction and um, why extrapolating some information and parameters that we use for the LV might not be as useful for the RV. And then there's a debate of whether we should be doing quantitative versus qualitative uh, assessments. And I'll make an argument for one and why it's important with the dynamic hemodynamics in the uh, operating room, especially after heart transplant. So these are the three planes in which the myocardium are oriented. And this is uh, specifically for the LV. So there's the longitudinal, so it's, uh, it contracts from the apex to the base. Uh, this is the radial component, so outwards, inwards and the circumferential, which is just in a circle. And so the LV is pretty evenly uh, proportioned between these three um, orientations. The RV is different in that there's a predominance of longitudinal shortening. So um, in the histology um, studies from, I think, the 60s, when they did cross sections, they noticed that there was a disproportionate amount of longitudinal fibers compared to the radial and circumferential. It's hard to say what the proportion is because once they do the cross sections, they actually will destroy the other orientations. So it's hard to see, is it two to one, three to one? It's, it, no one really knows, but there's definitely more longitudinal shortening than the others. And this is a, um, a meta-analysis from JASI. Uh, it's busy, but I'll break it down really fast for you. So there's nine variables. Uh, there's These are all the studies that in, included these variables, and these are the number of patients. And then these are the reference values. So the lower reference value, the mean va reference value, and the upper reference value. And the ones in boxes, uh, so the TAPSI, pulse, wave, uh, pulse Doppler at the annulus, MPI, and fractional area change are the only variables that were actually used in the summary of assessing RV uh, from JASI. Um, and just to note, the upper reference value is used for NPI, so the lower reference value, because it's an inverse index, so a higher number is worse. So this is like a borderline abnormal number for NPI. And uh, the confidence intervals, uh, I like to note, is there can be significant um, window of normal. So a borderline number might be normal for one person, but it might be abnormal for another. So just to keep in mind for if you're doing a quantitative analysis. And um, likewise, there's uh, on the left here is the RV quantitative assessment from anesthesia and analgesia. And this is the summary slide that I mentioned uh, briefly uh, on the last slide from JASI. So the way that they broke down these um, uh, parameters, uh, so they both agreed systolic performance is important. They both agreed that diastolic uh, function is important. And then they kind of uh, separated where anesthesia and analgesia talked about the combined RV and diast um, systolic and diastolic parameter, where Jassy talked about the, uh, the chamber dimensions. Um, oops, sorry. And one more thing that um, anesthesia and analgesia was talking about was the, the load dependency. So almost all of these variables are very load dependent uh, on the RV. The only one that, that they concluded that was not as low dependent was uh, isovolumetric uh, acceleration. So the situation in the context of all of these quantitative values is very important. So that's my argument for using qualitative. Um, so looking at the RV, is it dilated? Is it empty? Is the global function of the RV uh, good? Is there regional mo motion abnormalities? Is the apex moving more than the base or vice versa? Is the uh, shape of the uh, apex uh, apex forming, uh, which just means is the RV uh, more than 60% of the LV apex? And how does the septum look uh, in relationship to the LV? And all these questions can be answered pretty quickly from one or two views, but the more views that you have, the more um, educated uh, assessment that you can make. And this is just a exaggerated um, a uh, picture of what apex forming is. So on the left, it looks like a nice 60% uh, of the LV apex, this little section right here. And then here is a completely dilated, volume overloaded uh, RV. Can't miss that. So I'll show you an example here. So this is coming off of a heart transplant. 
And really quickly, you can tell that this is not a great functioning heart. So the, there's v almost minimal RV function. Uh, I don't have the measurements here, but it could be dilated here. Um, and we're on significant ionotropes. So here's 10 of dibutamine, 0.375 of milrinone, and now we're on ECMO. And it, it's, it's hard to say here, but um, in other views that I don't have here, uh, the LV is actually starting to distend. So we're having multiple problems here. We're having heart failure, we're on mechanical support, and now the LV is dilating. So increased dilation of the LV uh, increases cardiac um, um, myofibril oxygen consumption, and then it's just kind of like a positive feedback loop uh, with worsening function. And uh, so we have to figure out a way to uh, offload the LV. There's a few options. Um, what we decided to do here was put in a uh, KVAD. Let me see if I can go to the next slide here. So a KVAD um, where I trained uh, was actually the inventor of the KVAD. So uh, essentially it's a it's a VA ECMO with uh, an LV vent. Um, I know a lot of places do ECPELA, so uh, VA ECMO with an impella, uh, but this person was on central ECMO and they just put in a temporary LV vent in. So, um, this is what the heart looks like after being decompressed. It's very empty, perfect. The heart can rest. The RV, this isn't a full video, but it's not moving great, but it's uh, it's not extremely dilated. So this looks better. Just let them rest for a day or two. And then, uh, and oh, also just to note, the um, ionotropes also came down a lot with the KVAD. And then here is what the heart looked like the next day. So it's nice and vigorous. The RV's uh, moving a lot more. The LV's moving a lot more. Um, so this is a good result. I think um, uh, the at this point the the temporary LVAD came out uh, and they were still on ECMO, but almost on no support. So it was a good outcome. This person ended up walking out of the hospital. Okay. So uh, for the next portion, we'll talk about the anastomotic gradients. So this is a, um, a, a long axis of the uh, upper subgeal pulmonary artery. So for here, um, the instantaneous peak radiant was 19. So a little concerning. Um, so we told the surgeon um, and we took some more views. So for here, there's some turbulence in the RVOT and in uh, the uh, proximal PA. And then we also looked in some other views and you can see it even more here. There's a lot more flow acceleration in the RV, uh, the RVOT. So what we did here, and this is also with the chest closed, and we'll talk about why that's important later on. Um, so what we did here, we actually floated the swan um, up into the main PA, got a measurement and pulled it back into the RV. And then we subtracted the, um, uh, the, the two means and got a gradient of five. So the surgeon said there was nothing in the chest, no, no packing, everything looked good from his perspective. Um, so we actually uh, just closed the chest, left it as is, and um, the since the gradient was low, we were happy. The patient also walked out of the hospital. No issues there. And then here's a similar case. So this is um, after the chest was closed, uh, after the heart transplant. So the, the, the peak gradient here was, I think, 35. Yep, so it was 35. Uh, it was normal before the chest closure. So uh, we told the surgeon and uh, he said, yeah, the, um, he's not surprised. The, the, the donor uh, pulmonary artery was actually a little bit short. And with the closure of the chest, um, it actually uh, caused some compression. So they actually opened the chest back up and uh, did a PA plasty. So this was an interesting finding uh, when the chest was closed. Uh, here's the... Um, SVC IVC issue. So, the getting a uh, peak instant instant uh, gradient across the SVC and IVC, it's always going to be at a cosine zero. So the computer will never be able to do the math in order to get a gradient. So the only thing we can really do is either look at laminar flow, or do a direct measurement uh, across where we think there may be a stenosis. So here's a picture after a heart transplant. Um, qualitatively, it looked a little narrow here. So then we put some color on and there was some flow acceleration across the SVC RA junction here. Again, we told the surgeon, took some more views, 
and um, it was two centimeters in the uh, uh, lateral and medial aspect, and then one centimeter in the anterior posterior aspect. And just for reference, it should be two by two. So uh, there was 50% compression in the anterior posterior dimension. We told the surgeon, he said he's not surprised. There was a little bit of a size mismatch, mismatch uh, but the CVP was low and um, we measured um, a gradient. So we floated um, the swan to the RA and then we transduced off the, the cordis and the gradient was, um, I think, less than five. So there was no uh, functional stenosis across the SVC and they did fine, went home a few days later. So um, the whole post-op assessment should probably be done again after the chest is closed. And there's a few reasons why. Um, the the, the um, donor tissue can either be too short for um, that particular patient. And there's a lot of reasons why that can happen. Um, the donor can be either too big, too small. Uh, there can be packing in the chest. So the chest uh, was tight to close. So all these measurements should be done again once the chest is closed before leaving the operating room. And likewise, um, because the hemodynamics can change once the chest is closed, uh, looking at the function, making sure that um, the CVP is uh, stayed the same, the pressures aren't increasing, inotropes don't need to be increased, all of that is stable before going up to the operating room. So just to summarize here, um, RV failure is definitely the most common and cor uh, more morbid cor uh, complication after a heart transplant. Um, qualitative is, in my opinion, probably a better way to assess the RV, especially in the second to second, minute to minute um, setting of a heart transplant. Uh, the gradients are depend on the type of heart transplant that uh, your institution does. And uh, measuring those anastomoses before and after chest closure uh, is important. It can actually change what we do. Um, for the IVC SVC, just looking for laminar flow is usually sufficient. If there's an issue, then direct measurements, your only other option. Um, using multiple views for, um, instead of just one to make a, uh, educated conclusion is definitely the way to go. And, um, with heart transplants, it's in a new cavity. There's definitely not a uh, perfect size matching. Um, so non-standard views may be needed in order to see what you're looking for and direct measurements, uh, probably the gold standard if there's any issue and just talking with the surgeon, seeing what they have to say, um, they might know some minute details that can influence what we do. So, um, or put more context into the echo images that we're getting. So putting all that together definitely gives you more, uh, educated conclusion here. And then uh, here's a bunch of references in case anyone's interested.